Hello, hello. Welcome to our Tuesday Night Live. I'm so glad that you've decided to join me tonight. And uh, we're going to get right into it tonight. We've got a study on Mary as we continue to pray um, into the Christmas season and looking forward to 2021 and the good things that God has in store. And I'm believing that tonight is going to help inspire us with faith. And last week we looked at Elizabeth's story. This week we're going to continue along that same uh, trail of passages into Mary's story. Make sure as you get on here, make sure to say hello to me tonight. I do have my chat on. So uh, last week I had a little mishap and I couldn't even see the people writing anything in there. So <laughs> leave it up to me. I'd end up getting this technical stuff wrong. And I'm just thankful my son is in the behind the scenes seat, um, helping me navigate through some of this stuff because if it wasn't for him, I would be a lot more lost. So just thankful for the help. And uh, not sure all who is with us tonight, but I do know my sweet sister, um, Adeline's birthday was yesterday, and I don't know if she's on here or not tonight, but she's another one of our team members that I just absolutely adore, godly woman, um, inspiration, loves the Lord, but also just serves the Lord with all of her heart. And so I just want to wish her a happy birthday. If she's not on here tonight, she might be on here another, uh, a little bit later um, when she comes back for the replay. So we'll just get her a happy birthday in there. So let's go ahead and let's begin with prayer. For those of you who may be meeting me for the first time, my name is Lisa Cook. I'm with For His Beloved Ministries. Our goal at For His Beloved is to connect the heart of women with the heart of God through the Word of God so that we can fulfill the plan of God. And God has a good plan for his sons and daughters. It's the whole reason that Christ came was to redeem us to God's original plan, redeem us to God's design. And so we want to press in to know everything that he has for us. Amen. Hi, Letty, my sister, my fellow worshiper and prayer warrior. <laughs> um, Anyway, so that's who I am, and make sure if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. We are um, working to try to build up some momentum there, and so I just want to thank you for all of you who have done that already, but if you haven't, be sure you do. So let's go ahead and open with a word of prayer, and let's welcome the Holy Spirit into our study time together. The Word of God is rich, and, um, and I just know God has some good things for us tonight. So Father God, we welcome you. We know you're already in our midst and we just wanna ask Holy Spirit that you would open our hearts, open our ears, open our eyes to behold some new and fresh wonders from your word. Many of us have heard this story, so to speak, um, for a number of years, probably every Christmas since we have been saved. But I know, Lord, that every year you never disappoint. You always bring it fresh again. So God, we come to you tonight with just fresh enthusiasm. Our hearts and our minds are turned towards you. And we say, Lord, um, we just say we love you and we adore you, God. And we want to be all in kind, uh, an all in kind of worshiper, Lord. We want to feast on your word and we want to grow in the fullness of Christ. And I know tonight plays a part of that. So I know you're not going to disappoint. So I thank you in advance, Lord. We just want you to have your way. Holy Spirit, lead this and um, give me clarity of words and humility of heart. We just love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Okay. So are we ready uh, for Christmas? Um, let's see. Okay. So remind me at the end, I'm sure Nathan will remind me too. At the end, we're going to, we're going to stand together for our sister Mimi because she's got some big things going on that she's put in there. Make sure to be standing with her in prayer, but we will hold that up again in prayer at the end of this evening. And any other prayer requests, if any of you guys have prayer requests, it doesn't have to be necessarily for you. It could be for a friend or a loved one. We want to make the most of these opportunities to stand together 
because where two or more are gathered in his name, it says that he hears us. And we know that if he hears us, we have what we've asked of him. So let's make sure to make the most of that. We know it pleases God's heart when we petition and make intercession for one another. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into it. Last week, we looked at Elizabeth and, um, and we looked at Zacharias. And when we left them last week in Luke's gospel, chapter one, Elizabeth was pregnant and she's well advanced in years. And now it says, and this is in verse 26, it says, now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God uh, to a city of Galilee. And actually we have those verses um, this time. I got a little bit fancy this week. <laughs> Um, okay, it, to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Okay, so let's just stop right there for just a moment because there's a lot of content that, um, that we're being given here. It says, now in the sixth month, so this is not the sixth month of the year, this is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy because remember, this same angel, this angel Gabriel had just, um, you know, several months, maybe it was a year prior. I don't exactly know how long, but because we don't know how long it took for her to actually get pregnant. I have the idea that it wasn't that long after they got the word and Zacharias went home to his wife. It was probably pretty quick after that, that she got pregnant. And now six months later, she's six months into her pregnancy. And now he visits who? He visits Mary. Mary's probably about 14 years of age at this point. And so this is kind of a busy year for the angel Gabriel. I think it's interesting to note too that Gabriel is actually only mentioned in the scriptures this time, the incident with Elizabeth and Zacharias, but also in the book of Daniel, when Daniel was um, asking for understanding, God sent the angel Gabriel to him. And there's only actually two angels in all of the scriptures that we are given names of. There's um, the angel Gabriel and the angel Michael. All the other angels, we don't know their names, but we do know that there are myriads and myriads of angels that do the will of God. It says they do his word. One of the reasons I love to pray the scriptures is because I know it actually commissions angels into action on our behalf because they are ministering spirits sent to minister to those who are heirs of salvation. So they are here for our aid. They're here for our help. And sometimes we can kind of, you know, read right past this and, and just think, oh yeah, you know, an angel. But I mean, think about it. There's actually angelic beings around each of us right now because we're all heirs of salvation, I would assume, who are, who are watching this this evening. And so just to be aware, now we don't worship angels. We're not to be overly fascinated with them because we want to be fascinated with Jesus, but we do need to be aware of them because it helps us to be aware that there is an entire spiritual realm that we often spend most of our day um, forgetting about. You know, so many times in the morning when I'm getting up to spend time with the Lord in my quiet time, I just will make myself aware that there's an angel there, at least one, that is present with me. When I go to bed at night, I'm aware that there's, a, there's at least one angel there that is present with me. It just helps you become more sensitive to the supernatural realm, which is the parent realm, remember. It's, it's superior even to our physical natural realm, everything that we have. Um, came from the spiritual because God is spirit. And so I just think it's, it's good to, you know, kind of pause there and, and take that in. This is an, a true, actual angel that came to visit her and give her this information. And it says he was sent by God. Okay. So they, they do the will of God, right? Um, to the city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, Nazareth had a bad reputation in that time frame. It was, um, um, from what I understand, there were a lot of Roman military people who lived in that surrounding area. And so it would have been, you know, the, the Jews at that time were oftentimes harassed by the Roman soldiers. It was, um, it was a, a fairly oppressive environment. 
And Nazareth didn't have a good reputation. We know that from another passage in the scripture where um, Nathaniel says, can anything good come from Nazareth? Well, we certainly know the best gift that God ever gave came out of Nazareth. Um, and then we have, oh, oh, and also it says, um, one of the things I looked up told me that there, the population in the city of Nazareth at that time was probably around 1,500 to 2,000 people. So that's tiny, right? I mean, I live in a city that has, we believe, anywhere from 150 to 200,000 people. And in today's day and age, that's not even considered like a big city. That's kind of considered like a medium-sized city. But 1,500 to 2,000 people, people knew each other. Like they knew each other in that city. Okay. And then it says, um, he, he was sent to her to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph. This is important because back in Isaiah uh, chapter 7, this is the fulfillment. What we're seeing is the fulfillment of a prophecy that was spoken 700 years prior to this. 700 years prior to this, Isaiah said these words to King Ahaz. He says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. And we know that Mary is a specific fulfillment of that because in Matthew's gospel, chapter one, when Joseph is living through his own encounter, if you will, as this news is coming to him, um, that verse is quoted, letting us know that this was a direct fulfillment of that. This is so critical, so critical, because if Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, then he would not have been a uh, deity. He, he, would, he would have carried the bloodline of humanity into his life, which would have corrupted it. So he, he needed to be free of the bloodline of humanity, which is past science says that we, we get our blood um, from, you know, the, the type of blood we are, we get that from our father. So, so there's a sense in which that gets passed down from our father. And so because Jesus didn't have a natural father, God was his father. He didn't share in the same blood that we have. He wasn't tainted with sin because we're all born into uh, the life of sin. Um, we inherit that all the way back from Adam. It's passed on that sin nature, but Jesus didn't have a sin nature. Mary was his mother. Joseph was not his, um, his physical father as we know, but that's just important. We don't ever want to, we don't ever want to, um, to allow somebody to talk us out of that one, right? Amen. We need to make sure that we're hanging on and anchoring ourselves. This is one of those essential pieces of doctrine. Jesus was born of a virgin. It had to be that way. There was no other way. This is also something that we would not have been able to conceive in our own minds happening. And yet this is the wisdom of God. So she was um, a virgin betrothed to Joseph. And being betrothed in those days was the same thing. It had the same weightiness as actually being married, only you didn't have the, um, the full unity of that marriage, the full coming together, the consummation of that marriage. So they would have been contractually in a sense, like in a covenant, they would have been committed to one another for life, but they had not yet come together as husband and wife. And so at this point he was betrothed. And in order to break this, you would have had to have actually gotten a divorce, which only men could do in that time period. But, um, anyway, so, so he was betrothed to Mary and, um, and at this point, she is going to be given an opportunity to serve God in a way that is beyond our imagination. Okay, so it says, um, the virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. Now, the name Mary, because we, this is a study on Mary, right? The name Mary is actually a derivative of the name Miriam, and I thought I wrote that down somewhere. Let me see if I can find it really quick. It's a derivative of the name 
Merriam. I may not be able to find it with all of these different notes I have. Well, anyways, um, it was kind of, it's kind of interesting. It, it also, in modern days, it's the name Maria. Mary is the name Maria. And um, there was something, oh, here, wait. Okay, it's where we get our modern name Maria from. It's interesting, though, because it actually can be translated their rebellion, their rebellion, which I, I think is interesting because here you have Mary, um, and you think about mankind in rebellion against God, and she gives birth to the Savior. Now, the greeting that Gabriel gives to Mary is the first part of this, this study tonight that I think has tremendous significance. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and try to read through most of the rest of this, and then we're going to come back to these because there's some rich truths here that I want us to glean from tonight. Okay, so verse 20, 28, sorry. It says, and having come in, coming, coming into the house wherever she was, the angel said to her, rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. You can put those scriptures up, Nathan. Uh, this is verse 28. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. Powerful greeting. And so she says in verse 29, but when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying and considered what manner of greeting this was. Of course she was troubled because she's only 14 years old and you do not greet normally a 14 year old in this type of manner, she hadn't lived very long. She wasn't somebody who would have been given any kind of honor at this point in her life. And yet this was a very, very honoring kind of greeting. Okay, the next verse. Then the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, shall call his name Jesus. Let's just stop right there for just a minute because we know the name Jesus is a um, transliteration of the Hebrew name Joshua, which means Jehovah is salvation. Jehovah is salvation or is the savior. Jehovah is the savior, but Jesus was not an uncommon name. It wasn't like, you know, God just came up with this name right then and there. That name had been used for a while. I'm not sure when it um, began to be used in the, in the term, um, when it was switched from Joshua to Jesus. But you think about it, it's like God was preparing, right? He's preparing his people for the reception of their savior. Okay, so then it says, you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the highest. That's significant. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom, there will be no end. You can show these verses too, Nathan. This is, um, let's see, I'm in verse 34 now. Then Mary said to the angel, how can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. There we have it, not the Son of Man, the Son of God. And indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is now the sixth month for her who was called barren. For with God, nothing will be impossible. And that's our power verse for tonight. This is our power verse. Now, we've heard this. It almost gets cliche, but I'm hoping by the end of tonight, that we're going to have a new appreciation for these words. For with God, nothing will be impossible. Verse 38, then Mary said, I think that's verse 38. Then Mary said, behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Okay. 
So let's just go ahead for a second. Let's put up that map, Nathan, that shows where Nazareth is. Um, because remember, so she's having this encounter in the city of Nazareth, which I have it circled. It's, it's at the top portion of that map. And then at the bottom portion, you see Hebron, and that's where Elizabeth and Zacharias likely would have lived. Now, we're not told specifically, but that was the territory that was reserved for the priesthood to live in. Okay, that's about 60 miles away. And we know after Mary gets this news, that's where she's going to go. She's going to go spend about three months with Zacharias and Elizabeth. And we can uh, come back to that a little bit later at the end. But there's four things I want us to glean from her story, okay? Number one, there was the blessing of the Lord. Then there was the calling or the assignment of the Lord. Then there was the empowering of the Lord, the power of God. And then there was the agreement, the agreeing, her response to the Lord. She, she came into agreement. We just read that. Let it be to me according to your word. Okay, so the first part of this I want us to look at is the blessing. And I want us to take note of the fact that whenever God has something that he wants to accomplish through his people, it follows this order. First is a blessing, okay? And then there's the calling out of that blessing. And then there's the empowering and then there needs to be our agreeing. We have to come into agreement. You know, some people will say, well, God said it, therefore that settles it. No, even though God's word is true, no matter whether we believe it or not, if it's going to be true for us, if we're going to experience the benefits of this word, the benefits of his promises, the benefits of our salvation, we have to actually come into agreement with it. Just like we know salvation, if somebody wants to be saved, they're not going to be saved just because we know that you can be saved through Jesus Christ. You have to come into agreement with that. You have to open your heart to it. You have to say yes to it. You have to make a conscious, intelligent decision to say, I surrender my life to Jesus Christ. I believe he died for my sins. And all the benefits that we are given in Christ, we come into those benefits the same way. It's by grace through faith. And we have to, we have to align our faith with the truth if we want to experience the benefits. And so we can see this pattern being laid out for us. So the first thing the angel says to her is he tells her to rejoice, to rejoice. Now, um, Anytime God is going to call us to do something, he's always first going to lay a foundation that it's going to come out of whatever he's calling us to do is going to come out of the fact that he has, in fact, blessed us. Now, the word rejoice is the word uh, Cairo, C-H-A-I-R-O, and it means to rejoice, be glad, to rejoice exceedingly, to be well, to thrive. It is intricately connected to joy, intricately connected to joy and joy. This, I think this is so interesting because, um, a, a few years back, I went and I sat in on a class from a man, uh, it's a local, um, ministry school. And I was just, I was invited to come. So I went a couple of times and, and they were really good. Um, and the, the overseer, his name is, I think it's Keith Scad, and I, I might be pronouncing the last name wrong, but he was teaching on joy one of those nights. And he shared how he had had an experience years before where he, um, one day he was thinking about how whenever somebody would ask, how would you describe or explain, because he's a Bible teacher, and he says, and, and if he was explaining joy, he would always explain it like you would peace, like the joy of the Lord is like peace. You know, you just have a sense of um, a peace. You have a sense of um, stillness. You have a sense of security and that kind of thing. And I'm not sure of the exact words he used, but just the fact that he was describing him the same way until he really began to look more closely and he realized, wait a minute, joy and peace are two different things. Yes, we have peace in the Lord, but we also have joy in the Lord. 
And joy is not emotionless. It's not just like this sense of inner peace. It's actually something that makes you, um, in fact, let me, let me read some of these to you. Some of these synonyms for joy, bliss, cheer, delight, elation, satisfaction, exaltation, glee, wonder, merriment, jubilance, gladness, refreshment, wonder. Those are all associated with joy. You know, when I was studying this um, yesterday and I looked across my living room and I have on my mantle this, this, uh, this little block of wood that says joy to the world, joy to the world. See, joy for us is a person. It's the person of Jesus Christ. And the word of God says that in the presence of God is fullness of joy and in his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And the reason why I'm pointing this out is he's telling her to rejoice because she's about ready to be given an incredible privilege. And what was that privilege? She was going to be the mother of the Messiah, the mother of the Savior. For nine months, she would carry Jesus in her womb, and then she would give birth to Jesus. Now, it tells us in this passage that she was blessed among women. It doesn't say she was blessed above women. It says she was blessed among women. And later, now hear me on this. I want you to put these pieces together. Later on, there's a passage in Luke's gospel. Um, let me see if I can find it. Luke 11, verse 27 and 28. Because when I was studying this, this is exactly the verse that came to mind. This is later on in Jesus's ministry. And Luke eleven twenty seven says, And it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said, Blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. Now that's what this says, right? She's blessed among women. But then Jesus responds and says, more than that, blessed are those who hear the words of God and keep it. Who hear the words of God and keep it. In other words, they treasure it. They've taken hold of it. They've taken possession of it. They, they have latched on to it. And the reason for that is because even though Mary was greatly blessed because she was the mother of Jesus, yet she only had Jesus in her womb for nine months. And here's the thing, under the new covenant, the glory of the new covenant is Christ in you. Okay, so I know we're talking about physical, but we're also bringing this into the spiritual. We have an even greater blessing than what Mary had because what Jesus accomplished on that cross and ascending to the right hand of the Father and pouring out the, the presence of the Holy Spirit, we have Christ in us the joyful one, the one who in his presence is fullness of joy. So out of all the people in the earth who have reason to rejoice, it would be us. It would be us. Now listen, um, I, I wrote these. These are synonyms. Okay, I have synonyms for rejoice. And I wanted to uh, read you an antonym. An antonym for rejoice is be sad. So to contrast rejoicing with being sad. And if you contrast, these are, um, these are antonyms for the word joy. In fact, we have a, um, something he can put up for that too. So I want to read those to you really quick. Just take a look at those. Depression, melancholy, misery, selfish, or does that say selfish or sadness? Sorry. No. I think, where's my glasses? <laughs> okay. Uh, oh yeah, here we go. That's better. <laughs> Seriousness. Sorrow, unhappiness, discouragement, dislike, mourning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, vocation, work. <laughs> I think that's funny because um, work is not meant to be this burdensome thing, but when you don't have the joy of the Lord, it certainly can be. But if we're doing everything for the glory of God, we can actually make our work a joyful offering to the Lord. My point in this is that because of what Christ has done, we actually have joy living on the inside of us. We are blessed among all the peoples of the earth 
because of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now, let me, in fact, let me read one more verse to you. This is in Galatians chapter uh, two. Yes, chapter two, verse 20. This is one I have memorized, but I'm going to read it just to make sure I don't quote, misquote it. <laughs> one that we are familiar with. It says, I have been, cru-, this is Paul writing, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. Now, you know what? Sometimes when we read this passage, we're thinking, I have been crucified with Christ. We're thinking, no, I like, I need to be crucified with Christ. No, it's past tense. When you gave your life to the Lord, you were crucified. That was something past tense. It happened 2000 years ago. But as soon as you surrender your life to Jesus Christ, you were crucified with him. It's a past tense transaction. Now we're living out the reality of that. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. Christ lives. This is the beauty of the new covenant. Christ in me. Christ lives in me. Now listen, Jesus said this. Jesus said that the kingdom of God he said, he said, it's the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And he said, the, and what did he say about the kingdom? He said, the kingdom is within you. The kingdom is within you because kingdom means king, king's domain, right? King's domain. And Jesus is the king. And we have become his domain. We have become his headquarters, his primary place of operation in the earth. How does God get his will done in the earth? He gets it done through us, Christ in me. And as I cooperate with him, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As I cooperate with him, as I'm yielded to him, as I'm partnering with him, as I'm living and breathing with him every day because I'm aware that I'm just, I'm not some ordinary person. I am blessed among women because I carry Christ in me and you carry Christ in you. This is the wonder of the new covenant. And I just, I think there isn't even nearly enough emphasis on this. If we really understood it, oh my goodness, I think it would just radically transform. This is one of the reasons I do not believe Cry, like there's all this stuff going on in the world, right? And um, some of it can be so discouraging and, um, and almost depressing. But Christ in me, but Christ in me, I actually can bring change, the kind of change that Christ wants to bring because his life is on the inside of me. But not only that, he wants to see his bride, his church, come into the fullness of that, come into a a fuller and complete awareness of it so that we are living with the kind of confidence and security and assurance that comes with knowing that I have Christ on the inside of me. Okay. So, um, okay, so what, what was the next one on here? <laughs> I get carried away with that one. Okay, rejoice, he says, highly favored one. And that word for favored is the word karitu, C-H-A-R-I-T-O-O. It's only used two times in the New Testament. It's used here in speaking to her, and then it is used in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 6. Let me see. Did I mark that one? Let me, let me just see if I can get to it uh, quickly here. So I'm not taking too much time. Let's see. Where am I? Okay. I was just, oh, okay, here we are. Sorry. Uh, Ephesians 1 verse 6. Okay. This is the second time that, are, that it is used in the New Testament. Talking about what Jesus has done for us. It says, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which... He has made us accepted. That's this word, karutu. He has made us favored, karutu, in the beloved, in the beloved. Okay, so he's calling her highly favored, which highly favored is actually the one word. It's the one word, karutu. But you and I have also been called this same thing. You see, if the angel was to show up today and speak to us audibly, and we don't need him to because we have the word of God to tell us, he would say this to you. Rejoice, highly favored one. 
Rejoice, accepted one. Rejoice, karutu one. So what does it mean to be highly favored? Let's see if I can find my, um, my definition for this one. I think, did I write this one down? Let's see. Oh, here it is. Okay, sorry. <laughs> my notes are not in the best order tonight. Okay. It means to endue with special honor, make accepted, be highly favored, to honor with blessings. To honor with blessings. Every spiritual blessing we have been given in Christ Jesus. We are not void of anything. And then it says, and then he tells her why. Rejoice, highly favored, for favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. The Lord is with you. The reason she was, anytime God was going to do something with somebody, he would always remind them, I'm with you. It's what he told Joshua. It's what he told Moses. It's what he told Abraham. The Lord is with you. Now that's powerful. But see, we've got something better because Jesus said he's not, Holy Spirit's not just going to be with you. He's going to be in you. You're going to be a temple of the living God. You, you, you are an embassy of the Lord. He is made up a home in you. And see, no longer does he come to fill a temple. You now are the temple. So is God with you? Yes, God is with you. And if God be with you, who can be against you? And I'm telling you, this is the kind of confidence that God wants us to have going into 2021 so that we can um, move forward and recognize, remember this power verse, for with God, with God. This is, this is the, the passage that the angels spoke to Mary, but it is also the same thing that Jesus repeated a, hand, a good handful of times to his own disciples. And then Paul even picked up on it when he said, all things are possible through Christ. Right? He, was, he was kind of giving back our, his, own, um, his own rendering of it because no longer was it just about God with you, but now it's Christ in you, all things. We can do all things through Christ Jesus, right? We can do all, like nothing is impossible for us who believe. Okay, okay so then, um, so this is the greeting. This sets the foundation for the assignment. Because this assignment she was going to receive was not going to be an easy one. She was going to have to bear the brunt of a lot of people looking down their noses at her, people misunderstanding and judging her. Um, she didn't even know how God was going to handle this with um, the one she was betrothed to. She, remember, she was betrothed to Joseph. And, in, and when you go back, we don't have time to do this tonight, but when you go back and you look at um, Joseph and, and his part of the story, right? It tells us, it doesn't tell us that she ever actually told Joseph. It says that he discovered it. And so we know that Mary goes away, right? She goes away for three months after this encounter. She immediately goes to stay with Elizabeth and Zacharias. When she comes back, probably within a month or two, He's going to discover it, right? You can only hide a pregnancy for so long. Usually three or four months, you can pretty, keep it pretty well hidden. But man, by that fifth month, people know, people know. And so what happens though is she, I don't think she told him. I think that she just let him find out on, on his own because what could you say? You can't explain to somebody that you are, that this is a virgin birth. Who's going to believe that? And so he, he had minded to divorce her quietly, um, you know, didn't want to have her stoned, but minded to divorce her quietly. But then the Lord has an angel visit him in a dream. And I love this because she allowed God to take care of it. She didn't get in the, in the mix of it and muddy the waters because he might have thought that the dream he had was just, you know, maybe he was just thinking that because she had told him or she had tried to convince him. It might have confused everything. But because he just had a very clear dream, he knew that that child she was carrying was in fact the Messiah. So God brought them together in this beautifully God-orchestrated way, which is such a reminder to us because I think, especially as parents, 
we really feel like we got to straighten our kids out, right? But if we will commit them to God, and I'm not talking about when they're younger, but you know, when they're older, we commit them to God and let God speak to them. And I do pray. I pray at times as, like, Lord, come to them in a dream. You know, um, he did it with King Nebuchadnezzar. He also did it with Joseph. God can come to them in a dream or he can come to them in, in any number of ways to really wake them up. And so that's a good, good way to pray. Okay, so where was I? Okay, so he was preparing her for this incredible assignment. And um, one of the ways that he did that was by making sure she understood that she was favored, that she was blessed, that God was with her. And then she asks him this question, how can, I, how can this be so since I do not know a man? Now, we know that Zacharias asked a similar question but Zacharias asked because he couldn't believe. He, he was struggling with believing what the angel had told him. She's not struggling to believe. She just is trying to, she's just being inquisitive. You know, God doesn't mind our questions. He doesn't mind our questions. If we are full of faith because we really want to know the answers, we can ask. And it doesn't mean you're necessarily going to hear the answer right then. But I guarantee you, I can't tell you how many times I have asked the Lord, you know, for the longest time, um, I would read through the gospels about how Jesus would heal people. And I just had so many questions that I felt like were taboo. Like, don't ask about that, right? Like we don't talk about that because we don't apply physical healing to, um, to people's lives today. Well, I mean, that's kind of how I thought, but as I just really began to get open and honest with the Lord, the Lord began to open the scriptures to me like I had never had them open before. And I realized that so much was so simple and so plain that I had missed it because so many people try to complicate things. You know what I'm saying? So don't ever be afraid to ask God just straightforward, direct questions, but do it in faith, believing he's going to answer you in a way that you can understand. Because there's a lot we don't understand. I mean, that's for certain. And then he tells her, he says in verse uh, 35, and the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. So that's how she gets pregnant with Jesus. The Holy Spirit overshadows her. It wasn't some um, physical encounter. Holy Spirit is a spirit, so that didn't necessarily mean she felt anything. In fact, I think as soon as she gave him her obedient, her affirmative response to what, she, to what he had spoken to her, I believe that's probably when the exchange happened, when she became impregnated with this, um, with the Christ, with the Son of God. We can't know for certain because it doesn't tell us exactly when it happened, but we know how it happened. And um, we also know that this is a picture of the Holy Spirit coming on us. This is, a, I mean, she had this happen so she could conceive the Son of God. But after Christ was raised and ascended to the right hand of the Father, he poured out his Holy Spirit so that we could have a baptism of the Holy Spirit. So that we could do what? So we could do supernatural things. So that God could gift us and anoint us and equip us to walk in supernatural giftings, the kinds of things that only God can do. And then I love this because he tells her about Elizabeth, because again, this was going to be a really challenging path to walk. And she needed the, um, the encouragement. She needed the support of like-minded people in her life. And we cannot underestimate the value of connecting with people who have faith like we have faith. This is why it's so um, such a hard time right now when people are not coming together because we need to we need each other. We need to be together, but we also need to find people who are like minded in the faith because let's be honest, there's a lot of people who call themselves believers, but they really are not walking in faith. Like they read the word, they do devotions, they do nice little devotions, but they're not walking in faith. They're not really believing what God has promised. They're not really standing and contending in faith for what God says. 
They're allowing all the things of the world to get in the way. And so you've got to find some people that you can connect with that are traveling this path and really believing. And they're not going to... Um, they're not going to also be people who are wearing down your own faith. We want to minister to people like that, but we also need to have people that we're connected with that we can stir up one another's faith. And then, of course, he tells her, for with God, nothing will be impossible. Nothing will be impossible. Now, let me, let me just reiterate this again. Because Jesus... Christ is living on the inside of us. This is true for us at all times. This right here, if we want, if we want to take God up on his offer, this is true for us at all times. And who is the one that is living on the inside of it? In fact, let me just go back and um, read Isaiah chapter nine, right? Here's another beautiful verse spoken 700 years before Christ came. And then remember there was a 400 years period of silence before Jesus was birthed by Mary. And remember last week, for those of you who are with us last week, um, I said many times when God is about ready to do something spectacular, there's what's called a dramatic pause before the punctuated answer. You talk about a dramatic pause, 400 years when it seemed like the heavens were brass and God just seemed silent, silent. I mean, there were prophets that would minister. You know, we have the prophetess Anna that we're told about, and there was a couple people like that. But as far as like God moving things um, with regard to his people and salvation and all of that, you know, just moving in history, it just seemed like God was silent. And it was the dramatic pause before this incredibly punctuated answer of Jesus Christ. He was preparing things for his son to enter the world. So in Isaiah chapter nine, verse six, it says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. Now remember, the kingdom of God is within you because the kingdom is the king's domain. And if Christ is reigning in your life, the government of your life is upon his shoulders and his name will be called. And this is, this is what we need to be reminded of. Wonderful, meaning he's full of miracles, counselor. He's the omniscient, all knowing God. There isn't anything he doesn't know. He's our counselor. He's living on the inside of us. He's mighty God. He's the all-powerful, omnipotent God. Nothing is impossible with him. And where has he taken up residence? He's taken up residence within you. You are an embassy for the living God. You are a temple of the living God. And he's the everlasting father. In other words, he is the one, he's the good shepherd who's going to parent you all the days of your life. And he is the Prince of Peace. You want peace? Just know. He says, my peace, I leave you. I, I give you, not as the world gives, do I give to you. He's given us his own peace. And did you know he's like totally at peace right now? He's not coming to part of the scenes. He's not anxious. He's not worried. He's totally at peace. Now, when we lose our peace because we've lost our connection with him, he carries that as a concern because he wants us experiencing the benefits of our relationship with him. And then it says of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And upon the throne of David and of his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from this, from, I'm sorry, from that time forward, when, when Christ came into the world, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. This is the one. He's the one that we have living on the inside of us. Let me read to you something from my um, devotional. Oh, also, let me mention this too. I'm kind of <laughs> a little bit all over the place. Okay, I have this, this gift I want to give you guys that has that verse um, printed out. And I just want you to know you can get a download of this. It's in the link in the description below. 
And so this is a printout of the verse. So you can add this to your Christmas. It does, obviously doesn't have the frame. Just print it out on a nice piece of cardstock. It's an 8 by 10. And um, it prints out really nice. And, and it's a good, I mean, this is what Christmas is really all about. Unto us a child was given. Joy to the world. He is the one. He is the one who's living on the inside of us now. And because of him, nothing shall be impossible to us. Okay, let me, um, this is out of my little devotional. The last devotion I have in there, I actually talk about, for with God, nothing will be impossible. And I was just thinking about those words that were spoken by the angel to Mary. And I just want to, I want to read this to you before we close this up. What time is it, Nathan? Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, we're going to close this up in just a minute. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, with God. Okay, for with God, with God, nothing will be impossible. Man, we need to make that our own. The first thing these words, okay, the first time these words were spoken in the Gospels were through an angel speaking directly to Mary. 30 years later, Jesus would speak the same message using similar words to his own disciples. But my thoughts today are drawn to Mary. I wonder how many times she spoke and by faith anchored herself to these courage-infusing words. No doubt this truth was deeply etched upon her heart and soul through the storms of life. Each time she faced a seemingly impossible challenge, her declaration became, with God, nothing will be impossible. When she told her family, and Joseph discovered that she was pregnant and the fear of being stoned and ostracized threatened to overtake her for, from her community loomed over her. She said, with God, nothing will be impossible. When late in pregnancy, she had to travel to a great distance and face giving birth far away from the support of her family. She said, with God, nothing will be impossible. When the only place available to give birth was a dark and dank cave, she faced it bravely knowing, with God, nothing will be impossible. When she held baby Jesus in her arms for the first time and wondered how she could ever be the kind of mother the Messiah needed, she remembered, with God, nothing will be impossible. When fleeing to Egypt with a newborn baby, not knowing where they would stay or how they would live, she trusted with God, nothing will be impossible. When as a family, they face times of leanness and harsh conditions, knowing that if there would not knowing if there was going to be enough food, she believed with God, nothing will be impossible. When she lost her husband and had to go forward as a single mom, as a single woman, we don't know exactly when Joseph died, but he's not on the scene during the years of Jesus's ministry. So at some point before then, he had passed away. She said, with God, nothing will be impossible. When she watched the brutal world crucify her firstborn son, the promised one, she held tightly to, with God, nothing will be impossible. When she heard and saw he has risen, she rejoiced, with God, nothing will be impossible. And here's the thing, what are you facing? What are you facing? What impossibility right now? We all have them. We all have them. What impossibility? What looks impossible to you? Because one of the reasons Jesus came was to restore to us our dignity and our ability to reign in life through him so that we could know with him, nothing will be impossible for those who believe. So we need like Mary, we need to align ourselves. She says, behold, the maid servant of the Lord, that's a, a place of humility. Let it be to me according to your word. Oh yes, Lord, we stand according to your word. Not what we see, not what we hear, not those things that the enemy will whisper to us in the midnight hour to try to terrorize us. But we say with bold confidence, and listen, we have to say it. 
We've got to give voice to it. This is how God accomplishes his will in the earth. Christ in me, his kingdom is on the inside of me and his will gets done through me. When I align my words, my faith, my belief with what he has said. And so when we put it into our mouths with God, nothing will be, I don't know what you're facing right now, but you need to say over it with God, nothing will be impossible. So, um, I was thinking about this woman. Oh, well, I know what it was. I had this, um, this story that I read a couple days ago and she had been diagnosed with a cancer and they had sent her home. She was a young woman and they sent her home and uh, told her that she basically needed to just make arrangements because she only had a certain amount of time to live. And uh, she was still staying with her mom and um, she's a believer, loved the Lord, um, had peace about going to be home with the Lord, was in the word. But then one day she was reading in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 24, and she's reading there and you know, it says, by his stripes, you have been healed. And she said, she, for some reason, those words had never hit her before, but she began all of a sudden to have faith to believe that she could be healed. She had already accepted that she was sick and going home to be with the Lord, and she was okay with that. But all of a sudden, she had faith to be healed. And she told her mom, she says, Mom, you know, I've never really looked at this passage before, but could it be that when Jesus died on the cross that he didn't only pay for my sins, but he also paid for my healing? And of course, Matthew 8, 17 tells us so. It says, he bore our infirmities and carried away our sicknesses. And so here's what she did. She made a decision. I'm going to believe. I'm going to believe with God, nothing will be impossible. You know what she did? She went and she took off her pajamas that she had been wearing. And she started to get herself dressed like a normal person. She had been sick for months. And she began to do things. She just began to act in faith. And within 20 minutes, she was completely restored. <laughs> now, I'm not saying it works like that for everybody. But here's the thing. She aligned her faith, her belief with the word of God. Let it be. Let it be to me according to your word, Lord. Let it be to me, not according to the doctor's word not according to the, to, the, to the Associated Press's word, not according to uh, what the doomsayers are saying, Lord, but let it be to me according to your word. Nothing will be impossible with God. I'm telling you, I feel it to the very core of my being, in my bones today, that God is saying, will you take him at his word? Will you stand in faith with what he has promised and what he said? Because that's how you'll see the reality of those promises. And that's how our faith is not only be stirred up, but it's going to help bring us into the plans and purposes that God has for us. Because even though all this crazy stuff's going on in the world, God's plan for us has not changed. It hasn't changed. In fact, the harder the things look, the more glory he gets when the reality of it comes forth. Amen. Okay. So let's just take a couple look, a quick look here at these prayers. We have Mimi who said, I'm, um, uh, please pray for healing in my home, much stress 16 days before the trial. So we want to keep that in prayer. Uh, Letty's asking for a coworker whose autistic daughter, um, is expressing thoughts of suicide. So we want to take authority over that. Am I missing any other ones, Nathan? I don't know. Okay. I'm just looking for a second set of eyeballs. Okay. This, this looks good. And then I also have a friend whose son was in a car accident, I think yesterday morning, if I remember correctly, who's waiting for surgery on that. So we're going to stand in faith together for that. So let's, let's put this into practice. And Father, we just declare right now, nothing will be impossible for you. And we say, let it be unto us. Let it be to these, for these people that we love. Let it be according to your word. And Father, we just continue to stand with our sister Mimi as they await this trial, Lord. We do pray. You're a God of reconciliation. You're a God of healing. You're a God of restoration. And where the enemy has sought to steal from them, to rob them, God, of peace, to rob them of relationship, I'm looking to you, God, to bring a restoration and redemption to that and to restore what the canker worm has eaten away. The enemy will not 
He will not have an advance in this area. We rebuke him in the name of Jesus and we stand with our sister that you're going to deliver good news into her hands. We don't understand all how it's going to work out, but God, we trust you to be able to do it because with you, nothing is impossible. And we know, Lord, that you are for every person in this situation. You want to masterfully redeem it for good and for reconciliation and for healing and for peace. And I give you praise and thanks, Lord, for how you're going to do that. I pray, Father God, for this co-workers um, of Letty, um, that child, Lord, who's considering thoughts of suicide. We know, Lord, that suicide is nothing but a work of Satan to try to deceive people into taking their own life. So Father, we pray right now in the mighty name of Jesus, we bind the enemy and we pray God for, um, for peace. We pray for joy. We pray for rest. And we pray most of all, God, for hope. You are the God of hope. So we pray, Father God, in Jesus' mighty name, Lord, we just break off the lies and we declare hope and restoration of courage in this uh, young person's life, God, that you have the victory. We just stand in faith with the authority we have and we release your will. You have the victory in this young person's life, God, and that they would go on to live fruitful, successful, abundant years. And I just pray for the healing of the autism too, God. I just pray in Jesus' name for peace peace to bring restoration for this child. And um, what was the other one? Oh, and then also uh, we want to pray tonight, Lord, for Dante, who is in the hospital. And you know the details, Lord, with the accident. And I just continue to stand in faith with my sisters for a complete and total restoration of his body, that the, um, that the tissues and bones and um, tears and all of that stuff going on, Lord, we just declare the victory of Jesus the healing of Jesus. I pray, God, you send angels, Lord. You commission angels to minister to him, to minister in that, um, that space, Lord, um, to bring hope and peace. And Father, we know that, um, that even this, you're gonna work for good in his life. And I, I don't know where his relationship is with you, but I pray, God, that this would bring him even closer to your heart and he would know how good you are, how compassionate you are, and how powerful you are, God. And so, Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word and thank you, Lord. Thank you for the greatest gift of all. Thank you for the joy of the world. Thank you for making your home in us. And I pray tonight, God, that you awaken us to, the, to this, um, this wonderful glory of Christ in us. And Lord, that more and more we would grow in our understanding of what that really means. For right now, right here, it's not just that you came into the world, it's that you so did a work that you came to live in us. And we thank you, God, we couldn't be more privileged. We could not be more privileged. We give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Okay, thanks for joining me tonight. Don't forget to uh, get your free little download, my little gift. I was making these up a couple nights ago. And uh, there's actually a couple different colors. So you can check that out. It's just kind of a nice little printout. And again, if you haven't already done so, be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel. And good night, my sisters. I do see Adeline. Again, we just say happy birthday to you, sister. <laughs> Who else is on here? Ruth, God bless you. God bless you, ladies. Have a good evening.